Welcome to this guide for the English Language Paper 1, Section A. This resource is based on the GCC English Language Paper 1 exam from 2018. It is designed for students taking the English Language GCSE, and it's going to talk you through the questions you might be asked with example answers with highlighting, talking you through how to respond to each one. Here is a copy of the front of the paper and you can see it asks you to write in blue or black ink, answer all questions in section A and then one title for section B. And then it advises you for the reading section, which is section A, to spend around 10 minutes reading the resource material and then 50 minutes answering the questions. Students tend to find this quite difficult to answer in enough detail um, as they quickly run out of time. So having a exam friendly watch um, or when practicing your phone with the, uh, with the counter or the timer in front of you would be really useful to get yourself used to how quickly you need to get through the questions to get to the grade that you want. You can see the reading section, section A is worth 40 marks and to get a pass grade or grade five in the English language DCC, you'd need around half marks, so 20 marks. You'd need around about 23 marks to get the grade 6, or around about 18 marks in order to achieve the grade 4. You can now see on the screen then examples of three of the questions that you would be asked with the advice exam would give above. They start by saying section A is worth 40 marks. They ask you to read the passage carefully and the separate resource material to use for section A then answer all the questions below. When they say separate resource material, they're referring to a pull-out uh, sheet that you'll find in your exam paper that you can lay in front of you while answering the questions on your line sheet of A4. That way you're not flicking backwards and forwards in the booklet. We're told there is going to be a story that is paper one, so it will always be a fiction, a piece of fiction you're given, and it tells you a bit about it. It is set on a Caribbean island where the main characters, Emma and Robbie, are on holiday. You'll notice for each question, it gives the lines you need to look at for each one. For example, for question one, read lines one to six. And then it talks you through each question and what you've got to do for it. Some of the questions give you bullet points to help you out, while others um, are seen as easy and so do not give you bullet points as guidance. You can see how many marks each question is worth in brackets on the right hand side of the paper. Some questions will give you words in italics or advice in italics underneath. You can see an example there for question two. It says you must refer to the language used in the text to support your answer using relevant subject terminology when appropriate. Subject terminology are words like noun, verb, adjective, alliteration, simile, metaphor, personification, or even just descriptive sentence. These are words that in English as a subject, you might well be able to apply to certain words or phrases you find in your story. Some will be quite common, like adjectives. Others might be easy to spot, like similes. And others you'd need a quite high level to be able to notice words like juxtaposition or oxymoron. It's important when it mentions relevant subject terminology not to go hunting for this terminology, don't go hunting through the text for similes, metaphors, etc. But if you do happen to notice they're being used, that probably gives you a good quote to comment on. Here's a copy of question four and five on the exam paper. There are five questions in total in paper one. And you can see once again, the exam board gives some bullet points to guide you and they give you an idea of which part of the text to look at. Question five will always ask you to consider the passage as a whole, that is the whole text in total. But in this case, they have specified they would like you to mostly focus on lines 55 to 70. Now I'm going to talk you through and see examples of my responses to each question that I completed in exam board times um, and the planning that went to achieving those questions. 
on the screen is the text, it's the text itself. And as you can see, it's about a side and a half long, with once again in italics at the top, a brief overview of the text to give you an idea of roughly what the context or situation is being described. If you're watching this at home, the text itself is probably quite small. So I'm just about to read it to you, um, just so you get an understanding of what this text is about. This is a clean copy of the text with no highlighting or notes made down the side. You'll see how I planned my response um, in a second. The story is then set, as we know, on a Caribbean island where the main characters, Emma and Robbie, are on holiday. Emma is always falling in love. She thought that it was her, that for her it's a lot like skydiving. You leap impulsively into the air and trust your parachute will open. The men she fell in love with were usually married and awful as well. Her friends tried to find nice men for her, but these kind, polite men didn't interest her. She usually wanted men who were successful, who she could look up to, which often meant she had no real time for anyone else, including Emma. Why she couldn't spot this kind of man a mile off was a mystery, but she was fearless. At this time in her life, Emma was in love with Robbie. He was 20 years older than her, a stocky, red-bearded Scot who was well known for his grumpiness. Emma mistook it for shyness. She thought he was more mature than he was, and therefore difficult to understand. During the early stage of their relationship, Emma almost killed Robbie. She didn't do it on purpose. They were on a Caribbean island and staying in a house that belonged to a friend. They were there for two weeks, and by the end of that, uh, that first one, Emma was feeling the need for some time apart from Robbie, although she still loved him as much as ever. Emma, who was more physically adventurous, began to go for long walks. Sometimes she would climb cliffs or make her way along slippery ledges visible only at low tide. Occasionally, Robbie would go with her, but more often than not, he'd stay at, at, the, at the house and sulk. Near the house was a beach, and across from it, about half a mile away, there was an island called Wreck Island. There was an underwater ridge running out to Wreck Island, and there was, there was a local tradition that at low tide it was possible to walk to the island along the ridge. The water would cut to your neck, they said. Emma got the idea into her head that she'd like to walk out to Wreck Island. She couldn't explain why. To Robbie, she put it down to boredom and said it was a challenge. She wanted to persuade him to make the walk with her. She wasn't totally reckless, and although she still believed she was invincible, she didn't mind having the full backup. She knew that Robbie didn't really want to go, but she knew she'd be able to, he wouldn't be able to resist the word challenge. She made it clear she was going anyway, and that he, in the end he agreed to accompany her. He said he'd need someone to keep an eye on her in case she got into trouble. Emma chose their gear carefully, including bathing suits, running shoes and floppy sun hats. Then she, would, she felt she would each need to carry a water bottle for a long, and a long walking stick for feeling their way under the water. At low tide they set out and there were few spectators there to see them off. Emma went first. Finding the ridge was not difficult. The water was quickly up to her armpits and the footing wasn't bad. The ridge was about a foot wide and dropped steeply on either side. A quarter of the way out, Emma realised the water was much colder than it was when you just went swimming in it. Also, the current was stronger than she'd thought. The truth was that she hadn't given it much attention. The tide had begun to run in again and she decided they wouldn't try to walk back, but signal someone to come out and get them. Until then, she'd not really thought about getting back. This was typical of Emma. She disliked going backwards. She felt the waves were getting bigger, and although she was managing to use her stick, it was harder to keep her footing. Her muscles began to ache, and she had to concentrate, which is why she didn't look around earlier to see where Robbie was. Now she did. At first she didn't see him at all. He wasn't on the ridge behind her, where he should have been. What she did see was a hill overlooking the bay was covered with people, sitting quietly, as if at play and watching the performance go on before them. The performance was Robbie drowning. He'd been swept off the ridge and was being carried out to sea by the current. All she could see was his sun hat. As she watched, an arm came up and sank again. She raised her stick in the air and shook it at the hillside. Do something, she yelled. She pointed at Robbie with the stick 
as if it were a magic wand and she could con command him to stop and float backwards. She felt helpless. She knew she could not swim after him and rescue him. If she did that, they would both be lost. She had to keep walking or the water would soon be too high. In the end, they sent out Horace in an ancient rowboat. Nobody else could chance it. Everybody sane kept their boats on the other side of the island, where there was a safe harbour. But Horace was stubborn and liked to keep his boat where he could watch it. He was also, luckily for Robbie, as strong as an ox. He fished Robbie out of the water and rowed back to shore. The crowd cheered and Robbie went into shock. Emma re reached Wreck Island and sat on it, shivering and worried about Robbie, until someone remembered her and sent a motorboat out to get her. Nobody complimented on her daring. Instead they said what a damn fool she'd been to try such a thing. Why didn't you stop me then? Emma said, doubly annoyed because she knew they were right. The bartender said that everyone knew she was that sort of woman. Get an idea in her head. No use trying to get it out, he shrugged and went polishing on the glasses. Emma felt terrible without Robbie. She sat at his bedside where he lay wrapped in several blankets and held his hand and actually did say, Robbie, what have I done to you? Only in books do people think of original ways of expressing grief and fear. Robbie was a kind man whom she loved and she'd almost killed him. Emma made tea for Robbie and coaxed him to eat, going as far as to bake him some cakes. He lay around while Emma groveled. As soon as he felt better, he became more grumpy than usual. He felt humiliated by the whole incident. He felt he was ageing, although Emma, being 23, didn't understand this at the time. She wondered briefly whether she ever wanted to marry Robbie. After all, but soon he recovered and they flew back to the real world. Told by Margaret Atwood. As you can see, the text is very long, and there's some quite hard words in there, and there are certain sequences in there that cause tension um, or drama. This is typical of a GCC text in terms of its length and its composition or the way it's structured. There's likely to be a description of a character at the top, some kind of relationship about halfway down, and some kind of dramatic event of some kind about two thirds of the way through, which is then resolved or completed by the end of the text. Now let's take another look at the questions then and begin looking at example responses. You can now see in front of you how I've planned for this assessment. There are certain things that are immediately obvious that I've done to prepare for to succeed in this test. One is that I've highlighted the quotes in yellow. So what I did was read through each question, highlight the quotes I need, read the next question, highlight the quotes I need. So already I've got one, a set of quotes that I know I, that I can use. Two, I know roughly how many quotes I'm going to use for each question, links to the number of marks I get. And three, once I've highlighted them, my brain in the background will be thinking on what to actually write about them. So although this seems like it will be a waste of time, many students don't plan their work in this way, it actually increases my chances of success in the long run. You'll notice, because each question is based on a different section of the text, I've numbered or uh, bracketed the text on the left hand side. You can see I've labelled question 1, question 2, question 3, question 4 and that last section would be question 5. Um, many students do tend to not look at the right section of the text so this is a really easy way of ensuring that the quotes I find to link to the question are in the lines that the example is specified. Anything outside those lines that I use would not then be counted. Remember, the italics part at the top is not part of the text itself, it's just an overview, so I've deliberately left that blank. Now let's start looking at my actual responses. Please do take a look at your own planning. How does it compare to this, or have you not planned? If you haven't, I'd strongly suggest that you do, at least by putting the brackets around the outside of each section, because if you make a mistake there, that deliberately uses marks straight away. OK, let's look at question one. List five things you learn about Emma in these lines with five marks. Question one is my list question. And as you can see, with five marks means I need five different answers. The example would tell me a range of responses. If I was marking this, it would be correct. And as you can see underneath there, I've used the wording of the question back to the examiner for each one. I've bullet pointed my work, so it's really easy to make out each one of my responses. 
and I've actually noted down how long it should take me in the border. So I put Q1 for question 1, and then 105 to 110 underneath, so I don't go over the time that I can actually use for this question, so around right about 5 minutes. My response reads then, Emma is someone who falls in love easily. Emma is trusting in her own feelings. Emma has a, has a bad choice in men. Emma is vain as attracted to success. And Emma is not afraid of anything. Notice that I use a, a range of different responses there. I'm not repeating the same answers. And each one is a full sentence that links to the question. Thereby, as far as I can tell, I'm aiming for five marks here. Remember, this guide is about how to write a response rather than how many marks they'd actually get for each one. Compare this to your own answer. Did you use full sentences? Did you link to the question set? And have you used five different responses rather than just repeating the same thing in different ways? Let's move on then to question two. Question two is the what impressions question. You will normally be asked about one character or two characters in this question. It'll ask you basically what you can tell about them. It's worth five marks, which is once again in brackets to the right hand side. And the exam board normally have that little bit in italics underneath. You must refer to language you use in the text to support your answer, which means you need quotes. And then it asks you to use relevant subject terminology where appropriate. So that tells you that words like noun, verb, simile, adjective would be needed for this question. But I remind you, you shouldn't be hunting for them in the text. But if you happen to notice an adjective, then please do use the word adjective next to that word. Let's now take a look at my response. You'll notice it's quite short. But it's only worth five marks. I've put question two or Q2 in the margin. I've put five dashes to represent how many marks it's worth. And I've once again put my exam timings, 108 to 112, because I can only afford to spend about five to 10 minutes on this question. I've then begun my response then, talking about both characters. And as you can see, I've checked my work by highlighting three different colors. Green is for the technical language, and yellow is for the quotes, and my link to the reader um, is in orange. I'll come to that in a second. Emma and Robbie are contrast to each other, as the writer juxtaposes their personalities to show they are not suited. The writer says Emma was in love with Robbie, which suggests to us the strength of her feelings, as if she cares more than he does. The adjective grumpiness describes Robbie's negative attitude, and he's often mistaken by her, which suggests that they don't understand each other. Robbie is made to sound like a child as he sulks, which implies to us he's immature and out of t and um, he's the immature one of the two. As you can see then, I've added in when I've, I nearly forgot to use links to reader. So what I did was just quickly go back through my work and add to us every time I've mentioned the word suggests. Thereby making sure then I'm describing effect on the reader throughout. In this response, I was looking for a pass mark. So I stopped at three quotes, knowing that half marks is my grade five. And I was more concerned with timings at this point and I've ticked off those quotes on the left-hand side next to my dashes. So I think I'd probably get three marks out of five for question two, which would secure me a grade five or better for this question. Question three, then is the next section of the text, lines 17 to 30. And I'm being asked here, how does the writer show the character of Emma from, from these lines? So this is much about her personality. What I can tell about what she's doing, what she's thinking, and my reaction to that. It's worth 10 marks, which means I need 10 pieces of evidence. Because this is a much longer question, worth more marks, the examiner has kindly given me two bullet points to help me. What Emma does in these lines would get me marks, and the writer's use of language to show her character. That tells me I can use quotes for bullet point number two, but equally, what the, literally what she does in the story would equally get me marks and count as evidence. Once again, the exam board have given me in italics there how you know that they would like me to use subject terminology where appropriate. But once more, I remind you, do not hunt for it. But if you happen to find a simile, 
feel free to comment on it. This is probably a good quote to use. Here's my response then. You can see it's longer than my question two because there are more quotes I need to use. I've put my dashes down the side, 10 of them, it's worth 10 marks. And I've clearly labelled Q3 or question three on the top left. I've stuck to the idea of writing down my timings. So I started this at 1.14. And I've got round about a uh, quarter of an hour to write my response, which means I should stop writing this question at around about 1.30 um, in this particular exam. Let's read through my response then, and you'll notice similar colour coding to question two. Overall, we see Emma as naive or stupid from these lines as she takes needless dangers. Or that should probably read needless risks. Emma takes silly risks and does it um, and doesn't think too much. Got the idea in her head, suggests to us she's quite simple and quickly gets carried away with her ideas. The quote, she couldn't explain why, could suggest she doesn't really connect with Robbie and so is unable to explore her feelings. It uses a statement to show this. She is willing to sacrifice her life for a challenge, which suggests to us she's brave but foolish. This is exaggerated when she says she is invincible. This adjective suggests she thinks she cannot be stopped and is silly enough to think no one can beat her. She is defiant um, of Robbie's feelings. He didn't want to go, but is selfish as she drags him along anyway. She is clearly confident and feels she knows best. She doesn't understand the danger she's in as she selects sun hats rather than objects that would be useful or a benefit to the dangerous expedition. Notice once again, I've, I've stopped at the halfway mark. Okay, I've stopped at around about six pieces of evidence. I've checked it through. You can see in yellow the quotes that I've used and you can see in green the technical language and in orange the links to the reader. Links to reader and technical language do not need to be there as often as quotes, which is why you see them a lot less, as it is the evidence and explanations that gain me the most marks and really get me the past mark. You'll notice in some places um, I've forgotten to use technical language, most notably in, in line number three there, where I had to say it's use a statement to show this. Um, that's what I'm thinking about as I wrote my answer, what I'm being marked for and then adding or changing or manipulating my answer as I wrote it to make sure I did tick off the things the exam board seemed to require. You'll notice the range of quotes. Some are five words long, others are single sentences or single words. Single word quotes means I'm showing the examiner I can analyze the text, but it's quite important that I do use some longer ones and some shorter ones to show that I do have that higher level of understanding of why exact words are being used as well as making sense of full sentences as well. Notice I'm repeatedly linking to Emma as she's the character I'm being asked about. If I started talking about Robbie, I'd get no marks for this because that's not the question the exam, the, the character the exam would want me to talk about. Okay, let's now move to question four. Once again, we're given the next section of the text and the writer's going to ask me how did the, does the writer make these lines exciting and dramatic? They might say atmospheric in another exam paper. They might say tension, how does the writer create tension? But question four is always about the structure of the text, how it is uh, laid out, what order the events appear in. Once again, this is worth 10 marks found in brackets on the right hand side. And the exam board once again gives me bullet points to help me um, with underneath that good old bit in italics mentioning subject terminology. They then ask me what happens in these lines to build excitement and drama, which gives me the clue that I can talk about events in the text. The writer's use of language and structure to create ex ex excitement and drama, so that's my quotes. And then lastly, it makes really clear that I need effects on the reader. So that's our words like us, we, I, that show that I felt something when I read the text. I reacted to the events being described uh, by the writer. Now let's take a look at my response. Immediately you'll notice this is the longest response of the group. Um, I've divided it into four sections in total. 
I've started with a short overview or short introduction, then looked at the start, then the middle, and then lastly the end. I've clearly shown the examiner then that I'm, sh I'm talking about the structure or layout of the text. How does it begin? How does the character or situation develop? And then what happens to, uh, to the character or situation by the end? Once again, I've put Q4 in the top left hand side to say, tell the examiner which question I'm answering. And I've put 10 dashes down the side, but I've then ticked as I used each quote. You can see out of the responses so far, this is the highest marked. I think this one probably get the most marks in total, simply because I've used the most evidence for it. So nine pieces of evidence at the possible 10. I started this answer at 125, and once again for a 10 mark question, I'd expect it to be around 15 minutes worth of writing. Overall, the writing is tense and dramatic as we witness Robbie's drowning and revival. At the start, we are told of the dangers through a description of the cliffs. Uh, Path sounds safe, footing wasn't bold, uh, sorry, footing wasn't bad, whereas others sound dangerous, drops steeply, implying a sense of danger and height. The verb realize tells us that Emma knows it was a threatening situation and still continued to, um, and still continued onwards which continues to build tension. Notice that first section I've used three quotes, explained them briefly, but in this case I'm more interested to mention the word tension. How is drama or tension built in that opening section? I've only used three quotes here because the whole thing's worth 10 and I know I need to talk about each section, the beginning, middle and end. So I need to be aiming for about three quotes for each section um, of this response or this section of the extract. Let's continue reading them. As the extract continues, the tension increases. That shows the examiner then that I can see that things have changed by the middle. Something is worse by the middle of the extract. Robbie is now in danger and we are scared of what will happen to him. Notice the reader's reaction there. I am scared, we are scared of what's happening. At first, suggests to us that it's going to be a sequence, as if we're going to be told events in slow motion. The word performance is given to, to us, sorry, is given to suggest to us that it seems almost exaggerated and not real. The small details are given like an action film. An arm came up and sank, which makes us think Robbie may die. As at, by the end, tension is released as Robbie lives. The writer makes us think they are uh, naive by saying that everyone's, um, everyone's sane kept their boats, implying that only mad men go into the water, but a superhuman Horace, strong as an ox, is there to help. The simile, strong as an ox, suggests that only a really powerful act can save Robbie. This is exaggerated by the fished Robbie which implies that Robbie was weak in comparison to Horace, but he was saved, um, which releases the tension. Once again, you can see I've used three quotes in each section, and then how the extract ends, and how that is not as dramatic or tense as the rest of the extract. I think I'd get close to nine marks for this. I think the examiner might well go a little bit lower, give me eight. And once again, I've highlighted links to the reader in orange, technical language in green, and my quotes used in yellow. Please do the same with yours if you've done a mock answer. How many quotes have you got? For question four, the structure is equally important. So have you started with an overview? Have you looked at the start of the extract? And is that clear to the examiner? Have you looked at the middle of the extract? Is that clear to the examiner? And have you said what's changed by the end of the extract? And that's really important. Have you looked at what's changed by the end of the extract? And once again, have you made that clear to the examiner using a sentence start or topic sentence? For example, by the end, tension is released, dot, dot, dot. If your answer on the page looks similar to this one, you've probably got a good organized response. You just might need to check your quotes and made sure that you are deliberately saying what tension is created with each piece of evidence you found.
Let's move on then to look at question five of five. It once again says I need certain lines, 56 to 70, but it says or reminds me I can use the passage or the whole text um, in my response. It gives me a statement. The writer uses the walk to record and show the change in both Emma and Robbie. And then it asks me, how far do I agree with this view? 10 marks is in brackets, telling me how piece of evidence I need. And then once again, the exam would kindly give me two bullet points to help. It asks me to write about my thoughts and feelings about how Emma and Roddy presented in these lines and how the writers created these thoughts and feelings. It says underneath you must refer to the text to support your answer. But in this case, no technical language is needed. When it says refer to the text, that's reminding me I do need quotes. It's not just about my thoughts and feelings. It's about my thoughts and feelings based on the evidence I am given. So you'd expect to see a range of quotes and then how I felt about those quotes throughout the response. Here's my answer then. I start this at 139, which you can see on the top left. I've labelled it question five or Q5. And then I've got my dashes, one to 10 down the side and ticked them off as I use my evidence. Overall, I agree that the relationship has changed. Now it's likely the exam board will want you to agree with the statement they give. So it's important I do that straight away. Yep, I agree that the relationship has changed. Emma is now a housewife and much less independent. Sat at his bedside, made tea for Robbie. Both make me feel that he's released her, um, sorry, realized, she has realized her mistake before she felt um, he is the problem, but now words like terrible suggest she's really changed and regrets her ways. The view of them from the community has also changed as they are seen as damn fools by the others, which means we think they are equally stupid to do what they did. We are frustrated, however, that this change in their relationship doesn't last. Back to the real world implies that we think they didn't really change after all. Now, out of all the responses, this is probably the weakest. I think I need to focus a bit more on their feelings and their relationship and my opinion on that relationship. But certainly you can see there one, two, three, four, five bits of evidence highlighted in yellow. But in this case, I've got in blue the bits that link to my, my emotional standpoint, my reaction to what's being said, my opinion. The words agree, make me feel, uh, they were equally stupid and frust we are frustrated or clearly indicate my opinion of the characters based on the evidence that I'm given. The evidence includes quotes from the text as well as things that they did during the whole story. You can see it's a lot shorter. At this point, I was running out of time. And once again, I've ticked off the evidence. So I think this will probably get me between four and five marks out of a possible 10. If I wanted to get four marks, I would simply need more evidence. And I'll probably go into a bit more depth of why my feelings have changed, how I react to the events, and which character perhaps I feel most sorry for. Thank you very much then to listening um, to this talk through response um, to the English GCC exam paper, pay, uh, English, so English GCC exam paper one. Okay, and this example was taken from the 2018 example uh, paper. Thank you very much for listening then. Good luck in your English GCSE.